It's always such an honor to be here. It's just an honor to be with the King of Kings peeps. Anointed and appointed and this is really, if you can already sense it in the atmosphere. You know, when Jesus walks in the room, he creates a climate. Right, and so um, I'm just going to meander here in the cloud <laughs> and the rain. I mean, you could tangibly feel it. It was like it was felt like rain um, standing down there. And um, so it is an honor. It is an honor to be here. And tonight, you know, I I function. I have my calling and my gifting, and, and an anointing of power. But that's, that's for everyone, right? We all have, it's, a, it's an equal playing field. I'm just up here tonight because this is my calling and what God has gifted me and empowered me to do. But in the same way, each one of you sitting here tonight has a calling, has a purpose, has a deep relationship with Jesus. And I just felt like I want you tonight, and we're already there, so I, I feel like I didn't have to, you know, come with a plow <laughs> to kind of make the way. So I'll just throw out three of the pages. But that you... There, there, the Holy Spirit is already here. The power of God is already here. And I want you to go deeper tonight. While you're sitting there, I want you to go into a place of faith with God for his power to come into your life in a transformative way. You know, we have been, I'm going to pivot tonight um, off of the messages that I have been sharing on my uh, Heaven at 11 broadcast. Some of you know that I do that. Some of you don't. But every Tuesday morning at 11, the Lord directed me back in the summer to, um, to do a broadcast. And he said to me, it's Heaven at 11. And I was like, Lord, at 11, everybody's working. It will be me at 11. <laughs> And he said, no, that's what it is. Now, sometimes we wander off the path and we do heaven at 7 on Thursday night. But generally, it's heaven at 11 because that's what he said. And one of the, one of, well, let me just backtrack a moment in that several years ago, well, all through a large portion of my ministry, I've been in the ministry for all, next year, it's going to be 40 years and um, actually, Mike and I are going to be married 40 years next year. So it is coming out of the wilderness, baby. <laughs> nah, he's been a Moses all along. He's, he's good. And um, anyway, so we, we, I had all these words for media. And most people didn't realize it, but I had actually gone to college for communications and media. And that was my major. And I... Okay, Lord, I won't tell them that. But anyway, I switched majors, okay? Uh, I'll give you a little hint. I saw myself one time on the monitor, and I'm like, I think I'm going to major in something else. I cannot subject America to this kisser. Like, somebody else can do it, you know? So, um, but anyway, I always had that, that even naturally, that gifting from the Lord to desire to communicate and was put in positions to communicate. And so we had, um, we had launched a TV program. Actually, Tricia, we had her on there. It was called Beautiful Life TV. And my uh, creative director from California came. And, we, and I work also with Mark Russick in New York, who works for HBO. And we just, we got all this, like, just beautiful equipment. And I had my house and my living room all decorated. And that was our studio. And everything was just, you know, going fine. And we were producing it. And everything was going wonderfully. And then in 2017, my mom got ill in Florida. 
And so everything, and I'm sure, Kathleen, you know, and many of you know what it happens when a loved one needs care. And in reality, that is the ministry. If you can't minister to your own family, I don't need a platform. My mother had no one to help her. And so we moved her up to New Jersey, got her settled. It just was three years of, of really, you know, the Lord, me having to lay down the things that I was doing to do that. And one of them was the media. It's just like, and then COVID came. So that, you know, changed things, of course. And so when the Holy Spirit in 2020 spoke to Mike and I, had a series of dreams and things to leave the Cranberry area and um, to come up here by faith, we didn't even know what we were doing, where we were going, so we rented. And, and, and to, to speed it up a little bit, we ended up renting and then we happened to have to find a house in the, in the time span when everything was 50 million offers on a house. Like, you, you know, like you could go 100,000 over and they wouldn't even look at you. So we just trusted the Lord and in his goodness, he found us the perfect place for us to just settle in, but we had to downsize. And so I no longer had the studio and um, was, you know, just a lot of different things going on and I had all this equipment. And so we just came up here and I was going to put it in storage and the Lord spoke to me and said, just give everything to Peter. So I gave all our TV cameras, our, all our media equipment to Pastor Peter. And I just said, you know, when it comes time for me to launch again, then I'll just trust God for all new equipment, a studio. I don't know what he's going to do, but just take it and, and, and be a blessing. And as far as I know, I think it was Reyes was telling me they use, I have a huge box that my creative director got that they use to take all the equipment when Pastor Peter goes to Times Square and all those places. So I get the reward of seeing God use that seed. So anyway, so now, all which is to say that we are back to humble beginnings. It's me and thankfully my very tiny assistant in our little cubicle office over there on Church Street with my camera in my laptop. And we just started. And, you know, that's I just did what the Lord told us to do. And it's been a blessing. We're reaching people. and um, But anyway, so... One of the reasons that the Lord told me to do it was our emphasis in heaven at 11 is that heaven is not a place so much as it is a dimension. And I felt the urgency that in this hour, God's people were going to have to really amp up their personal walk in the spirit, that we were going to have to know more than ever how to operate and be clothed and walk in supernatural power, that it was not just for the church building. It was just, you need the power of God to raise your children, work in your finances, care for your loved ones, work your business, right? Do your ministries. But you, the, the power of God is available for us in very practical ways. And so that's what our emphasis has been. And so I invite you to, to listen if you can. And if you can't, we upload the um, uh, post-production. We upload them on our YouTube channel. And also, since I'm in the process of getting my doctorate, that we also, it's like I'm, I'm like Gumby all over the place right now. So we actually even double dip and put them on our podcast if I don't have time to do the podcast separately. So we've been developing week by week the simplicity from the foundation of the word of how to move and operate in heaven now because we will need it. We need it now. And it's tangible. The power of God is tangible it is tangible. It is the substance of heaven. And I believe we already today started to feel it. And the, the wonderful thing about God's presence and his power, what power means, Greek, Hebrew, or whatever you want to say what it means, power is the ability to get something done. How many of you have things to do? Christine, you got to bake some bread. You need power to bake bread. If I had to get up that early, I'd need a lot of power to get me up to bake that bread. Right? So whatever it is you're doing, you need power. 
And see, it's very challenging for us in the church, and this is why I'm taking it precept by precept on the broadcast, is because over the past 50 to 60 years, America has become extremely secularized. We have a Greek mindset that has been ingrained in us since we were little children. Everything is rational and linear. In the Hebraic mindset from even ancient times, they have a spiritual worldview. In other words, they have an understanding that there is an invisible realm. And that is what the kingdom is. It's invisible, and that's why we need faith to access it. We use something invisible to get the invisible. And so we have to be trained to do that. And so I want to talk tonight about the power and how we access the power of God. The Apostle Paul, out of all the prayers he could pray, David, he said he wanted to know the Lord in the power of his resurrection. And I'm going to make this declaration in this pulpit tonight. There is not a demon. There is not a principality. There is not a power, a might, a creepy critter, any kind of spirit that is over the Lord. He is all powerful. He is all mighty. I want to say that again. He is all powerful. And for us to begin to walk in that heavenly dimension, and you all have heard this, this is so exciting for me to preach to the remnant. You are the hungry ones. You came in here with your tongues wagging tonight. And the Lord is saying, taste and see that he's good. There's going to be something while I am preaching that's going to drop in your spirit. There's going to be something that's going to blanket you. See, we think that, you know, we need somebody to lay hands on us. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right? That's one of the ways God ministered to us. But I am telling you, some of the most powerful encounters I have had have been sitting under the word in the presence. Because the word brings life. In Luke chapter 5, I love this story where it says that Jesus, one, it says one day Jesus was teaching. And all the, the scribes and the Pharisees and teachers of the law came from all the villages. And it says in Luke chapter 5, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord was present as Jesus was teaching. See, we think we have to get ourselves in all kinds of contortions for God to move. Jesus was simply teaching. Teaching the word. And the power of God was present to heal them. But guess what? They didn't get healed. But who did get healed? A paralyzed, weak person who had four other guys carry him down through the roof because they believed that Jesus could heal. They believed the power was present to heal them. The power is present tonight to heal you. The power is present to give you that wisdom that you need, that answer. How many of you need an answer? How many of you have been seeking the Lord for clarity? While I'm speaking, I could be talking about Mr. Ed and you could get a revelation. Because the Holy Spirit was talking to you because you're open and you're ready. And his power is here. And I just, there's, there's a tangible power that I believe tonight is going to strengthen this congregation. It's going to strengthen this people. And those, I know some people couldn't make it because of water in and around their homes and all that. And they could, they're probably listening online. Welcome all the online people or those that will listen to it later. I am telling you, there is a power, a strength that is coming to this congregation. There is a power, a tangible power in this season to lift us up beyond the natural over what the enemy is doing. See, when we say the word, come up higher, how many of you have heard come up higher, right? 
Come up higher. Yeah, no, that's right. Come up higher. Well, when we come up higher, two primary things happen. The one I talked about yesterday was perspective. Our perspective because we're looking down on things from God's perspective. But the other thing that happens is power. We, are, we have might and dominion because we are seated with Christ. So there is this power over that which is under us. And last time I read all the stuff we whine about and are fearful about and cry about is all under us. And so I'm going to unpack tonight, now, I certainly couldn't do all of it, but some keys, some secrets, some keys to operating in the power of God and releasing the power when you are the weakest. Hebrews 12 verse 12, uh, Hebrews 12 verse 12 tells us that we can feel weak in the ESV uh, the ESV version or whatever I, oh, ESV UK, I guess that's what I put the, we're, we're in, we're in jolly old England tonight, I guess. We're, <laughs> oh, therefore, therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. I don't even know how you got that, Reyes. I don't know where, what you be doing up there, but I was not looking at a UK version. All right, shall we try the International Children's Bible for all of you that say you can't read the Bible, okay? This is, you have become weak, so make yourself strong again. See, we have to, the devil loves to play the shame game. We become weary under the con. I have never, I said to my husband, I don't even want to answer my phone. Da, la, 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 when it rings, because every time it rings, it's a diagnosis from the pit of hell. It's somebody can't pay something. It's the most bizarre thing. A baby died. Or like just crazy because of the season in the atmosphere of war. It is not just on terra firma in Israel. It is in the atmosphere. It is an anti Christ spirit coming against the church we are the one new man we are rooted and so you think you you know we need our own iron dome right now and I'm here to tell you you got one you just got to know how to activate it and it's not going to be in your, in your strength. Some of you are going to get free. I believe the Holy Ghost is going to hit you. You're going to do a little glory dance on the way out of here because you're going to have strength that is not of you. Why does he say the, the drooping hands and the, and the weak knees? Because what happens is we're, we, the knees are symbolic of our prayer life. We're too weak and overcome and overwhelmed to even pray. Anybody been there? Or just me, Sally the same. All right. And then the other one, right, is our hands. Our hands are drooping down. We can't even praise. Things seem so overwhelming or so impossible. See, the scripture says prophetically that the, the, devil's, the devil's strategy is to wear out the saints. It wouldn't be in there if he couldn't wear us out. But we're going to submit to God's way tonight and he's going to flee. That spirit of weakness we're going to exchange for strength. The Lord told the prophet Isaiah... That he gives power to the faint. That he gives power to the faint. The, ampli the, amplified, the amplified version says he causes power to multiply and abound. Multiply and abound. And listen to the message Bible. This is the word of the Lord for us all tonight. The message of Isaiah 40 verses 27 through 31. There we go. Why would you ever complain, O oh, king of kings, mighty ones? Or whine, saying, God has lost track of me. Anybody ever say that? He doesn't care what happens to me. Don't you know anything? God answers. Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts He's creator of all you can see or imagine. He does not get tired out, doesn't pause to catch his breath, and he knows everything inside and out. 
He energizes. How many of you can use some energy? He energizes. This is the word. You can believe it or you can sit there like a lump on the log and go out as weak as you came in. But he is the spirit of strength and energy. Woo! Glory to God. He energizes those who get tired. He gives fresh strength to dropouts. Even young people. All you young people, you munchkins out there that get tired. Toby, where's she? Giovanni, she's a little baby. There's Toby up there. Sebastian, too. All you youngsters. You're all, half of you were younger than me. <laughs> You're, it says, they, even the young people, tire and drop out. Young folk in their prime stumble and fall. But those who wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and they soar like eagles. They run and they don't get tired. They walk and they don't lag behind. No laggers in this house. This isn't, let me tell you something. This isn't some charismatic hype I'm talking about. We're all going to go, yeah, and we're going to all become powerful. No, it's tangible. It's tangible. It's real. It's real. You should be able to do things that you never thought you could do. Because you're going to have to do some things you never thought you could do. You're going to have to pray in ways you never thought you had to pray before. You're going to have to read your word in ways that you never did before. You're going to have to get up and get your booty in church in ways that you never thought you had to before. You're going to have to love your spouse in ways that you never thought you'd have to before. God's drilling it down to everything. He gives you power. You, some of you need to finish school. He gives you power to finish school. Gives you power to do laundry. Trust me. I don't even know what page I'm on here. Oh, here we are. All right, so some keys to power. Now, each one of these I could speak on for a whole message. So I'm doing a drive-by, all right, on each one. And I'm just believing it's going to hit you. The first thing to tapping into that power is you got to get your eyes off yourself. You got to shut down the devil's shame game. You got to get your eyes off of yourself. And in the age of the selfie, that is, an, that, that is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Because it's all around us, the focus on ourselves. And one of the re things that happen happens is we is that we become frustrate, frustrated where we are currently with God compared to where we want to be. And we can be frustrated and shamed and think we're not enough. And before you know it, we've got the paralysis of analysis. We're doing a deep dive into every fiber of our being. Let me tell you something. There is so deep your belly button can go. It just goes so deep. There's just so much you can look in to yourself to try to figure out why you're weak and why you're not enough. That is why you need Jesus. That is why you have to stop looking at yourself and you have to look at Jesus who has been become your righteousness. He was the one who was perfect in obedience. He was the one who was perfect. The Lord doesn't need you to be perfect. He just needs you to be willing to be transformed. All you have to do is to forget perfection, just submit to transformation. It's that easy. And the, let the Holy Spirit do the changing. Some of you, I could see you're, you're getting free as I'm speaking because that, that demon's been talking to you. You're not enough. You're not powerful. Like, you know, you, you hear some of these people here pray. You want to run for the hills. They're so powerful. <laughs> they are. All this peeps up here. 
some great teachers in this house too. They're, they're power packed and you could sit there and you could say, oh, well, well I, I'm not, I, I must not be holy enough that I'm not that enough. No, shut that up. You have to shut it up. It's a lie. You have to look to Jesus. Don't look at yourself. You have to get one goal, one goal, the, a revelation this year, not a resolution, a revelation to know God more. Because when you know God more, God becomes more real to you. He unfolds his mysteries to you. You walk with him, and it doesn't matter because you're just moving with him, doing what he's called you to do each and every moment. And this ties in with humility. Humility is such a key to operating in the power of God. And this is a, a great key for operating in the power of God upon you to minister to others, but also for the power in you to manifest. It's that humility. Smith Wigglesworth used to say to himself, Wigglesworth, I am going to burn you up until there is no more Wigglesworth left and there's just Jesus to be seen. Now in our, in our therapy culture, we would say, well, that statement's loaded with a lot of self-hatred. <laughs> You're gonna burn Smith up? You're gonna burn yourself up? Listen to me, all right? You and I, believe it or not, are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are the pearl of great price. And Jesus doesn't have any eyesight problems. We are the treasure, his peculiar treasure, but we are his treasure in the earth. You are, he, he beautifies you with salvation. In his eyes, you are flawless. You are flawless. This isn't about self-hatred. This is about acknowledging it's okay to be weak. It's okay to be authentic and acknowledge where you don't cut it because you don't have to cut it all the time. He can. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's he got the focus all himself. And most of the time, it's our own inadequacies and insecurities that's what it is, and that's what Smith was talking about. Because he never, he never thought he would, it was a plumber that he would ever preach. The second one, the second key, you could, I'll give you two minutes to put on your helmets. The second one is holiness. I love holiness. Well, lady, you burning up your flesh, and now you're... <laughs> If we, when we understand what holiness is, it's awesome. I can't wait to be holier. And what do you mean by that? Like you're, you're, no, Jesus, I'm already holy in him. I'm already flawless. But I, I look forward to every day putting that devil in my flesh under my feet, under the control of my spirit. The key to operating in the power of God is having control over your flesh. And what's great is it's a key, and Jesus empowers you to do it, which is great. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness, and paid for, made his own. So then, honor God and bring glory to him in your body. Where was the power in the old covenant? It was in the temple. You are moving power. It was in the temple, but the temple was always put in order. Notice in those Old Testament, the cups went here, the candles went here, the curtains hung there, everything was in order. So you needed some more revelation instead of a resolution? Just get some things in order. It's the perfect time. What's, what's, what's having dominion over you? 
You know, I know this time of year that we, everybody's fasting. They're fasting everything, all kinds of different ways, all kinds of different days, all kinds of different fasts. Media fast, food fast, seven days, Daniels, seven days, 21 days. Everybody's, everybody fasts. And it's mostly because everybody overate over the holidays. <laughs> Even if you weren't a believer, probably some people are so like, you know, we, we all want to be holy. But, you know, one of the things that, that I learned, and I'm just giving a little secret here, a little nugget. You know, I learned from Brother Hagen. He taught us. He wasn't a person that did a lot of long fasts because he taught us how to live a fasted life. That didn't mean when he was pastoring, he would, he would fast like Tuesdays and then he would fast Thursdays. Sometimes he said when the Lord would speak to him, he had to seek him. He'd do like maybe three days or something like that. It's not that he didn't fast, but that stuck with me. I endeavor to never let anything have dominion over me. Have nothing in my life I can't control. I'm, t I'm, I'm talking about people. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about stuff. Whether it's media, whether it's foods, whether it's sometimes I, there's things I haven't had since I was 18. Now, I'm just sharing that with you. That's a fasted life. God wants us to be, we are of the world, right? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And so all that is, what, what I mean to say by that is listen to the Holy Spirit. There might be something the Lord's telling you to fast all year. And sometimes a fast is something you do, not something you give up. Does that, that, make, any, that, does that make any sense? All right, that's your word. And that will be the key to unlock the power and get the breakthrough. 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 21. Everybody tracking with me here? All right, no one's run out of the building yet. It's a good sign. Listen to this scripture. This is powerful. But the firm foundation laid by God stands sure and unshaken, bearing this seal, this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. That is so beautiful. And let everyone who names himself by the name of the Lord give up all iniquity and stand aloof from it. But in a great house there are not vessels of gold and silver, but also utensils of wood and earthenware and some for honorable and noble use and some for menial and ignoble use. No, so whoever cleanses himself from what is ignoble and unclean, who separates himself from contact with contaminating and corrupting influences, will then himself be a vessel set apart and useful for honorable and noble purposes, consecrated and profitable to the master, fit and ready for every good work. Now, what is so beautiful about this is the Lord tells us we can be clean, and he wants us, did everybody read the same verse I did? That he wants our vessels to be clean. Now, you think, what is she talking about that for? Because a lot of the church doesn't think that's a thing. That, that doesn't, that he's made us clean, so we're clean. No, you can do something to make yourself unclean again. Do you ever use a dish, have to wash it and bring to use it again? But this is, but he gives us the power. He gives us the divine ability. And a lot of it, again, is how we look at holiness. The best teaching I think I've ever heard on holiness is Robert Heidler's teaching on holiness where he talks about how holy means separate and set apart. It's holy. God is holy because there's no one like him. So how he likens this, and I can relate, is that it's like a special, it's that, that time of year, right, when I was raising my children, I had all my special china and all that stuff. When it was the holidays, I brought out the good stuff. That's when I brought it out. It was, oh, hello, I didn't know you were back there. <laughs> hello. 
Um, I was like, oh, there's somebody behind me. Um, it's special, right? It's unique. It's holy. God looks at you. You are my special China Easter. So because you're so special, why would you dirty yourself with something? Right? We don't put the china in the dishwasher. You put the china in the dishwasher, it gets ruined. It needs special care. And that's how Abba looks at you. And so when you start taking your vessel, your holy little cup, somewhere it's not supposed to go, or your cup starts talking about somebody a way it's not supposed to be talking about somebody, the Holy Spirit who's in you will say, mm, you shouldn't be saying that, mm, don't go there, mm, don't buy that, mm, don't eat that. It's, we don't need rules and regulations. We walk with God. He knows what's good for us, for each one of us individually. And this is a key to power. Why is it a key to power? Because the devil then has no place. You do not come become captive at his will. You do not get in bondage to anything. You're the free, happy china cup. Walking around praising the Lord. Holy. It's awesome to be holy. The next one, got two more and then we're wrapping it up. Now some of you might think this is odd, but... It's a key. Everyone say it's a key. <laughs> Giving you four. Calmness of spirit. Learning how to be calm in response to adversity and trials. It's a process to learn it, but it's important. Isaiah 30, verse 15, in the ERV. The Lord God, the Holy One of Israel says, if you come back to me, you will be saved. Only, this is what the Lord says, only by remaining calm and trusting in me can you be strong. But you don't want to do that. Why? How, now, anybody, I'm looking at the girls down here and some others. Anybody that has even a thread of Italian DNA knows what it's like to not be calm when something happens. The voices go up another octave. <laughs> the best way I could describe what it means to be calm is to show you what calm isn't. And a perfect picture of what calm isn't is George Banks in Father of the Bride. If you've ever seen, I always defer to this because I saw it and I thought, that is me. And I have learned over the years to take a breath when something happens. See, what we do is we get in panic mode. And when we get in panic mode over things, it's short circuit. We, we literally unplug the toaster. Because we're in a whirlwind of all these imaginations of the horror of what's going to happen. And if you grew up with my grandmother, granny, and my family, at the worst was happening all the time. And the worst was potential all the time. And see, what happens is when we are under pressure, that is when it happens and we explode in being overwhelmed and fearful and all kinds of imaginations of what can happen. And there's a scene in the movie, you can look it up on YouTube, it's, they title it, The Superfluous Hot Dog Buns. And George is at the house and they're planning, it's Steve Martin, and he is overwhelmed with this wedding. And they have his, he's tried on the tuxedo from when he was married and he's busting out of it. The whole back is open. The legs are split. He can't fit in his tuxedo. Frank is running around messing up his whole house. His, his son-in-law can't find things. He gets to the point where he's so frazzled because of all the things he has to do and he can't keep up with it. He decides to go to the grocery store and just buy dinner to get away from the house. 
And when he gets there, because he's so worked up over these other things, he goes to buy hot dogs and, and discovers that there's eight hot dogs, but in the bag of rolls, it's always 12. And he starts opening up the bags of the rolls and taking them out and putting them in another bag. And he's sitting there with the thing, and he's taking all these hot dog rolls out. And the end of the story is that he actually, the, the supermarket guy calls the police. He's in the jail cell in the split open thing. And he says, he's, when, when he finally sees his daughter, he says, I know I come from a long line of overreactors. <laughs> and that's what we do. We have to turn down the overreaction. I remember I, early on I learned this from Dr. Hagen. He would, he t would tell the story of he was walking up to his house and he had his, his wife, Aretha, was there. And Aretha battled a little anxiety. And um, she, they were walking and she was holding the kids. And they got to the, the front steps to open the door. And she said to him, Kenneth, if me and these kids drop dead right here, I don't think you'd ever worry. Because he, he just, he was, a, he was calm all the time, no matter what. I mean, I remember when his grandson was, was, um, was diagnosed with a brain tumor and all, like the whole community in Tulsa, ORU, everyone, was praying for Craig. I mean, it was like he was going to die. And he lived. I mean, he's preaching the gospel today. But he was calm, as calm as could be. And he looked at her and he said, well, Aretha, why would I worry then? You'd be in the presence of Jesus. Now, probably if that was me, <laughs> had a, you know, he would have had something. But the point is, is that it is, I, I actually just did an entire message at a conference called Silence is a Weapon. We have got to learn before we start spewing out our decrees, listen to the Lord. What we're, just take a breath. Just listen. What are we supposed to be decreeing? How are we supposed to be handling that incoming emergency? Because they happen, right? So we want to access the power of God. So stay calm. And the power will come. And fourthly, and then we're going to close, is, and David talked about this, and I think it's so important, is spiritual hunger. And actually, spiritual hunger undergirds the other three that I mentioned. We know that that Greek word for power is dunamis. But we have to stay, we have to stay hungry. We have to stay in a position where, you know, the word of God, where we are filling our hearts with the word of God and we are staying in prayer. No matter how hard it is and how tired we are, we have got to push through and stay in that place. You know, Jesus asked, needed his disciples to pray, and he said the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And we're all, we all get to this place where the Lord will maybe wake me up and I'll like roll over and go to sleep. And the next morning I'm like, oh, I know, I, I, you know, I should have gotten up. Yes, there's times that I do. And you know, the Lord, when, in, in that Gethsemane moment, it wasn't, we had no indication that Jesus woke them up all the time to go pray. We don't know if he did, but we know that at least this one time he did. And they couldn't do it because why? They were tired and they were weak. And so he gave them a key that their spirit would always be willing to do the things of God. Your spirit will always want to meditate in the word. Your spirit will always want to pray. A matter of fact, we're to pray without ceasing all day long. What does that mean? We all become the first church of the monks? No. It means that we walk with God. We fellowship with God. We take the time during the day to pray as he leads us. We have to be spirit-led. There's a, um, a great man of God who was used powerfully in the 1920s in Northern Ireland. And I thought that this was appropriate, that his country, Northern Ireland at the time, was in great turmoil and conflict. And there was actually bloodshed in the country. And the church became very afraid, um, very anxious. Sound familiar? <laughs> Right? The number one thing we're practically dealing with the church is anxiety. I think it's interesting that 
that the book of Philippians talks and the book of Peter talks about anxiety. Anxiety has been around for a long time, right? It's the same nervous spirit. But anyway, so this should really encourage us, or I should say I was so encouraged by this, and maybe you can get on the train, that there was such great anxiety, but there was a man called W.P. Nicholson. And in the midst of this anxiety and this fear in the church and nothing happened, he was a man of prayer. And they, they, they write of him that he, uh, he said that, that his prayer life and his preaching, what happened was he just was staying steady in prayer. Day after day, staying steady and steady through the conflict, through the bloodshed, through the uncertainty. He was praying. They said he would pray from the minute he got up until 12 noon. He wouldn't come out of his room. They said there were times, one time where he prayed so fervently that they opened his bedroom door and there was torn sheets all over the floor. He got so in the spirit and didn't know he would actually ripped the sheets. He was straining his body body in prayer so so strongly now believe me if I have rip sheets that's hard to rip a sheet <laughs> but that's what they, they said they said that they had never seen anyone like him since D.L. Moody in his generation and as he is doing that the spirit of God falls on him he starts holding evangelistic campaigns in the midst of of the chaos, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of souls start getting saved in these, evan these evangelistic campaigns, and all he was was a praying man, just a hidden praying man. And he said, listen to this, because we're talking about spiritual hunger, and one of the ways, the key ways, and I know we've talked about this in this body so often, it is praying in the Spirit. And, and uh, W.R. Nick P. Nicholson said, praying in the spirit kept him in the spirit of prayer. See, when you, I'm going to say that again, praying in the spirit kept him in the spirit of prayer. How many of you don't always feel like praying? But when we pray in the spirit, when we pray in the spirit, it brings and energizes the spirit of prayer. And we, whoo, glory. And we started this message with the scripture in Isaiah. And when I was reading about him, he happened to do this comment, commentary on the scripture in Isaiah 40, that those that wait upon the Lord renew their strength. And this is what he said, are you ready to get some strength? This is what he said. Are these keys helping you? All right. He, he wrote, I believe that as we pour out, God pours back and much more. I am glad I do not have to be Hercules to pray. I am glad prayer is just not geared to the intellect. Prayer is, pardon? Oh. Oh, getting an interpretation back there? I'm like, he's, having, he's caught up in the spirit having his own. Him and Reyes are having a prayer meeting back there. All right. Here we go. I'm going to try it one more time. I am glad prayer is just not geared to the intellect. Prayer is of the spirit. Listen to this, Easter Frazier. Prayer is of the spirit of God upon the spirit of man. Prayer is the spirit of God upon the spirit of man. From musty cells like that of Bunyan in Bedford, from the confines of the catacombs, from the steaming jungles, prayer has ascended and answers have come. In very, listen to this, this, oh, this, I love this. In very limited bodies, there have been and still are mighty spirits who have, mighty spirits, king of kings, in your limited bodies tonight, in our limited 
physical bodies, in our limited corporate body, there is a mighty spirit and there are mighty spirits. I don't care what you looked like in the mirror to, when, before you came. You are a mighty spirit. Your body's limited. All our bodies are limited. You don't have to take that shame. You don't have to look at your weakness and feel like you have to be in it forever. We're all limited, but when we get in the spirit and by faith we walk in the power, his power comes to us. It's supernatural. It's tangible. You'll feel it in your body. You'll feel it in your hands. You'll feel it in your spirit. We call it the presence. We call it the glory, but it's the tangible. It's the electricity of heaven. It's what moves and keeps the spirit realm moving and alive. In our very limited bodies, there have been and still are mighty spirits who have learned that when a hidden ministry is generated in prayer, it can do wonders. So I am here to tell you, King of Kings, every person in this room, if you are visiting, I'm here to tell you that... In the midst of everything, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the adversity, in the midst of impo seemingly impossible situations, I'm here to tell you that God has not fallen off his throne. The angels have not started collecting their pension, and the city of God is not in need of repair. He is on the throne, and he is all-powerful. And I don't know about you, but I don't have the time to glorify the devil all day and talk about what he's doing to this person and what he's doing to that person. Before you know it, we start we start talking about everything. Oh, my gosh, did you? Oh, my gosh, did you? Oh, my gosh. And we're like, we're like Steve Martin with the superfluous hot dog buns. We're overwhelmed, and we can't be focused, and the enemy neutralized our power but it is his power that enables us to overcome amen hallelujah let's stand up thank you Lord Woo, glory 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 Glory, glory, glory. The power of the Lord is present. The power of the Lord is present. The power of the Lord is present. Glory, glory, glory. We worship you, Jesus. Woohoo, glory. I thank you, Lord, for strength. I thank you, Lord, for strength for this body, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that our knees are not weak. I thank you that our hands are not drooping down. I thank you that we are strong in you and in the power of your might. Father, tonight I pray for every staff member. Lord, I pray for every elder in this ministry. I pray for every leader, Lord. Holy Ghost, we thank you that you're moving on our human spirit. I pray for those that are here and those that are not here, Lord. I pray now that, Lord, that you would stretch forth your hand, your powerful hand, your strong right hand that raised Jesus from the dead through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I decree that every leader, every elder, every department head in this ministry, that the spirit of weariness is being ripped off of them, that they are being lifted up into the heights, into the high places where they are over every demonic affliction, every demonic wearying spirit in the name of Jesus.